Hello, I'm Daryl Fox, uh, Terry's younger brother. I'm senior advisor at the Terry Fox Research Institute. I'm also a member of the Terry Fox Foundation, and I'm looking forward to digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe, and I'm on a quest to learn from the best. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one conversations with thoughtful, accomplished, interesting people in many different fields. On this episode, the enduring legacy of Terry Fox and the Marathon of Hope, through the eyes of Terry's younger brother, Daryl Fox. In the spring of 1980, Daryl Fox was 17 years old. He was a high school student. He left school early and he flew across the country from his home in British Columbia to St. John, New Brunswick. A few weeks earlier, Daryl's older brother, Terry, had dipped his artificial leg in the Atlantic Ocean, and he had begun to run across Canada for cancer research. For the next few months, Daryl was with Terry for literally every step of the Marathon of Hope. And since Terry ended his run tragically and died in 1981, Daryl and the rest of the Fox family have been continuing his mission and preserving his legacy. To date, the Terry Fox Foundation has raised $800 million. Daryl has held several positions within the movement. He's currently a special advisor and a member of the board of the Terry Fox Research Institute. Now, I've interviewed Daryl many times before, and I always struggle with how to introduce him without making it entirely about his brother. Even though Daryl is okay with being identified as Terry Fox's younger brother, I think he has his own story to tell. And over the past four decades, I think Daryl and the rest of his family have had as much to do with the legacy of the Marathon of Hope and the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been raised for cancer research as Terry Fox did. In this conversation, I try to steer Daryl as much as I can to talking about his own remarkable life and what his journey has been like since he arrived in New Brunswick more than 40 years ago. But of course, we do talk a lot about his brother too. Daryl shares stories about his childhood, about picking berries for money. He talks about the Marathon of Hope, including the growing crowds, Terry's speeches that made him cry every time. He gets a little choked up talking about it now. And just how messy and stinky it got in the van that traveled the entire route. Daryl talks about the challenges the movement has faced over the past four decades, what he has learned from it all, and also about the fact that he once ran every single day for more than 13 years. It is a fascinating conversation. It's an emotional discussion. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. One last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to the podcast and post a review of Digging Deep on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and share this podcast with your network. And if you're looking for more information on the podcast or everything else we do, please go to letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. Now, let's start digging deep with Terry Fox's younger brother, Daryl Fox of the Terry Fox Research Institute. Daryl, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to Digging Deep. We've had many conversations over the years, and I've learned so much from you about Terry Fox, about the work of the foundation, the Research Institute, about Terry's legacy and how it persists to this day. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation in particular because I want to focus as much on you as on Terry. And uh, I always find it fascinating. I read a whole bunch of articles about you Uh, leading up to our interview. And you're always, you know, it's always Daryl Fox, Terry Fox's younger brother. And you just introduced yourself as Terry's younger brother. And uh, that's kind of your, it's almost like it's part of your name. But but I want to get to know Daryl Fox a little bit too today. So thank you very much for joining us on Digging Deep. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, I think it's going to be a very short conversation then. (laughs) As you you just shared, I I have a tendency to go directly to the fact I'm Terry's younger brother because that's that's who I am and that's who I enjoy being. That is my 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 go to place and I'm very comfortable there. Um, But um, so a a conversation about me 
you might find um, it, it a little bit more challenging. I might be a little bit more defensive and guarded, but uh, I might find a way to get there because Terry will always surface at some point. Yeah, of course. And in a lot of your life, uh, your life's work really has been uh, in the context of Terry. So, um, so let's start by going back to your childhood. And what would you say is your fondest childhood memory? Yeah, well, I, there there are many, um, but I think what I enjoyed most was, um, you know, we were all of us, in, including mom and dad, love sports, you know. So um, there wasn't a minute of downtime when I, when I wasn't in school that I wasn't outside playing road hockey, soccer, basketball, running, whatever it, it took to to be active. I I just enjoyed that, and that include those close by neighborhood neighbors uh, obviously and and my peers those I went to school with and also very much um, family members when when the, the others weren't available and um, guess what um, we were very competitive we hated to lose you know that was definitely a part of the, the Fox uh, household didn't matter what it was whether it was monopoly or road hockey we we fought to the bitter end um, so we were all bad losers too at that point. And I'm not sure to what extent we've lost that. <laughs> over the years. Yeah. That's in the Fox DNA. I think it is there. Yeah. Very close, and very close to the surface. Yeah. <laughs> Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? Oh, I, Oh gosh, Bobby Orr. Of course. Yeah. I was, a, I was a big, uh, you know, just, I grew up during that, uh, that time when, when Bobby was big and, I, I, I admired his ability, but I admired the individual off the ice as, as well, and, and his personality, his humble approach to, to life. Those are qualities that, um, that, that I admired. And, um, and, you know, I never, none of us, none of the kids ever played ice hockey. We mm. never had that opportunity. Um, you know, one, money was hard to come by in the Fox family home. Um, you know, we were a typical working class family and, um, and two dad just wasn't in a position to, to, to drive us to, you know, 6am practices and, and mom didn't drive. So, so soccer was, was the sport because it was cheap. Um, but I loved we all loved, uh, hockey. So hockey night in Canada was really big in our house. Uh, we watched every, every Saturday night and, and that, uh, that is still there you know, mm -hmm. to this day. Yeah. And what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Oh, I, you know what? I really didn't at that. If you're asking at, at the age of 10, I, I wasn't, um, I, I didn't have the vision to look uh, that far. Um, later on, I, I like Terry, I had it in because of my interest in, in sports and physical acti activity, being a PE teacher surfaced early. It's what I wanted to do. Um, but something took me on a different path, I guess. Yeah, that's for <laughs> sure. Um, what would you say is your life story in six words? Oh, boy. In six. Oh, my goodness. I, you know, you did give me the questions in advance, but um, I decided not to look at them. I thought I would, <laughs> I thought I'd wing it. And, and here I am failing miserably. Um, well, I'd, I'd have to include, um, you know, Terry Fox in that uh, somehow. So um, maybe I need to think a little bit more. But uh, how about this? Know, I'm going to I'm going to I never do this, but I'm going to throw something out there. Terry Fox's brother continues his legacy. There you go. I'd like that's, that. That's pretty close, I think. That would be probably pretty <laughs> close to where I'd end up. Yeah. All right. You know what? I would probably be, you know, after I, I'd probably think of a quote of Terry's, you know, anything is possible right. if you try. Is that six words? I think it's it is. It's exactly yeah. six words. Anything is possible if you try. Yeah. For what do you feel most grateful? Oh, just, you know, today you know, Mark, just waking up, you know, being able to, to breathe and, and value life. I, you know, that, that, uh, that comes from Terry and that's the gift he's given me is appreciating every moment where we're alive and able to, to take in our surroundings and, uh, and have the best help possible. That's what I appreciate and value. And I'm thankful for Terry for that. Yeah. Just to dig a little deeper into that for a moment, I, you know, I often think about people who served in the war and, and came home and the person standing next to them, their life might have ended at 21 or 22. Um, do you ever, do you ever feel like that in the context of your family that, you know, Terry's life was cut so short and, 
and you've you've been able to live a lot a lot longer than he did. It's there. It's there often, um, quite often. I mean, as, as you know, what I do today is very much, um, you know, Terry's there every day, every almost every every hour. He's he's prevalent, and yet he's not here. Um, and so there's there is there is that feeling of guilt. Why you know why when someone so so good and and has had, had the greatest of intentions is is not here and yet I am you know so there there is that um, but um, I can't do anything about that Mark you know and, I've, and that's what I've shared in the past I can I have to accept history I don't like history I don't like how it's affected me personally. Um, but it's I guess it's given me a little bit of a purpose and, and motivation and a, an appreciation of, of what's important. So that's where I try to try to spend my my time. It, again, it's not easy. It isn't easy. It's, um, it's it's you can hear it now. It's always very close the pain aspect of it. But um, because of you know the, how incredible a story it was, and then all of a sudden it just ended. You know, it just just doesn't didn't seem fair. And having to always have that close by is not easy, but, um, but I, you know, you got, you got to take what you have and appreciate what you have and, and it'd be easy to dwell on the, the negative and the hard, the hard times, but look at how much he's given to me. And that's where I try hard to spend my time, but there are moments when I fall, I fall off and it's difficult. That's so understandable. Um, and, I, uh, you know, for what it's worth, I lost my sister when she was 37. So a little bit older than Terry was, but I, you know, like, like you, I sometimes wonder, you know, why was it her and not me? And, and why did I get to be the age I am now? And she didn't, you know, and, and uh, it's sort of, you know, there, there's, there isn't really a lot to be accomplished by thinking that way, but it's hard to avoid it sometimes, you know, it's just, it's tough. What would you say, Daryl, has been the best year of your life so far? Well, I gotta go quickly. That can answer that one quick, Mark. Nineteen eighty, you know, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely, it was it was the best of times, and also, again, as I just alluded to, it, it was the worst of times at the end. But certainly, wow, nineteen eighty was was big, and being being the third member of the Marathon of Hope, getting out of school early, yes, to <laughs> to, to, get, to join Terry and St. John New Brunswick, and to to witness what I always said was was like a miracle. It was like incredible what was. What Terry was accomplishing, and uh, I was able to take it in, you know, um, every day, long days, exciting days, seeing country, seeing the country the way no one has seen the country before, like <laughs> one step at a time, one mile at a time, one community at a time, and it was, it was, it was awesome. The great, the greatest amusement park ride, never wanting to get off, and and um, and it's it's still there. It's you know, I'm still able to reflect and remember and reminisce and share stories of uh, that that experience and I um it takes me there you know I I'm, I, I go back to I can see I can see that first day I can see that moment of seeing Terry run and fulfilling this dream as if it were um as if it were yesterday it was 41 years ago now so that's that's pretty cool wow and I enjoy that and then I'm you know how many times have people come up to me there's in it you know it's 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 less as the years go by and they saw Terry and I can, I, I have such a thirst when, when um, I hear a story like that, because it takes me right back there. And I can remember, you know, how obviously I, I have that marathon of hope feeling within what it was like. And, and to, to have the ability to share that with someone else, that is pretty cool. I really enjoy that. Yeah. I'm sure you never get tired of somebody saying, I saw Terry run through my town or I, I gave him a high five or something like that. What has been the toughest year of your life so far? 1980. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, let me extend it to 81. You know, the, yeah. The, the, yeah, the, the June 28th, 1981, um, you know, the, the day that Terry passed away. And, uh, you know, that was the, that whole period between Terry having to stop running on September 1st, 1980. And, and the end of June was really, really dark and, and difficult and, and um, I have very few memories of, of that period. I'm happy about that, actually. Um, you know, so just ex trying to to accept and cope with losses. You know, we, we didn't have the family didn't have people ar around or counselors to to go to at that point. We were left to try and figure it out ourselves. And um, so when you say, "Well, it was the toughest year," 
I'd probably add a couple after, you know, if I had the opportunity because 82 wasn't very good. Either was 83, you know, because I just didn't understand what had just happened. And so, but time helps. And, you know, um, unfortunately, I was given that opportunity and, and found my way through it, um, fortunately. And, um, but uh, yeah, 80, 81 was, was not the best of times post, post marathon of hope, obviously. So I, I have on my list of questions that I ask every guest, uh, I'm going to skip over it in your case, because it's what one person has had the greatest impact on your life. <laughs> I, think <we> know, <laughs> I think we know the answer to that one, Daryl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's the most important lesson that you've learned that you would share with others? You know, it's, you, it, you said it's about me, but here, here I am going to Terry, obviously. It's, it's, it's all about Terry and the lessons he's given me, and, and it's, it's difficult to choose. But I think I think what I always focus on is that yeah you limitations are self-imposed really you know I I wake up believing even at this ripe old age that I can still accomplish things um, physically and and mentally and and uh, the sky the sky is the limit like the only thing holding us back is is us um, because we find a way to talk ourselves out of doing really good and great things that could potentially have an impact on other people around us in a very positive way. So that's where I, um, that's the gift I think Terry's given me is that, that, uh, that ability to, to um, keep going, keep trying. I think, again, we all had it to, we're, we're all, we all come from, we're all products of Betty and Raleigh Fox. Um, but Terry obviously gave us a little bit more in terms of what he accomplished in 1980. If you were uh, giving a commencement address to a group of students right now, what would you, what would your message be? What would you want to tell them? It's kind of interesting because, you know, part of this world we now live in uh, has prompted um, quite a few, few more requests, you know, related to, you know, Zoom meetings and Zoom recordings or, or video recordings for, and so uh, I've had that opportunity to, you know, to, to share a few words to, to grads. And, um, you know, it, um, what's, what's interesting uh, is that, uh, again, I can relate to, to what they're going through right now because I, I missed out on my a traditional high school graduation. You know, I joined up with Terry, so I, so I can relate to that. Um, and, um, but it was, and, you know, I, that, um, that potential unfortunate situation turned out to be a blessing. And so that's kind of the message uh, I've been sharing is, you know, you may not appreciate this now, but it'll make you a better person going, going forward because you, you, you had to overcome this, this setback of not being able to celebrate with your, your peers the way you should. Um, but there, something good will come out of this. And if you are, if you're always focused on, on if the negative, then it'll win. It always does. But if you can see positive and find the positive and, and focus on the positive, which again is part of what I've learned, um, you will gain something more than what you lost from from missing out on your your grad. Yeah, that's that's a great point, and and you know I think more broadly the lesson of Terry Fox or one of the many lessons of Terry Fox, uh, which is really applicable during this pandemic, is. The idea that a an enormous setback can become a huge opportunity, can become a defining moment in your life, and you can turn it into something that, in in retrospect, you wouldn't give back, right? Um, and I think I think Rick Hansen, uh, who was who a friend of Terry's, of course, and uh, you know he's he's had the same message that that. Uh, if you, you know, you, you face a setback and you, and if you turn it into something greater, um, then eventually you reach a point where no matter how devastating that setback was, it's become such a big part of your life and your story and the impact you're having that you wouldn't swap it for anything else. Right. I mean, that's, you know, Mark, but you know, just let's seg- continue on that because that's exactly what Terry experienced and what he felt, you know, he don't, don't feel sorry for me, you know, losing a leg has made me a better person. I, and, and he, and I, I often share that story of, uh, you know, there were times during the marathon of hope when Terry would say, uh, you know what, I'm almost glad I was diagnosed, diagnosed with cancer and I lost my leg because I'd come out of it a better person. I realized that, you know, giving, which wasn't part of my life 
pre-cancer is, is, is important. And now I am giving back. It's made everything so much more rewarding because, you know, just walking, forget running is a, that much more of a challenge. Everything is more challenging. Everything is that much more rewarding. That's how he looked at, at uh, you know, the, the loss of his leg, that um, it, was, uh, it, it was that much more rewarding. And he would, if it happened to, if he happened to, he would say that if he happened to lose his other leg, that would, it would double the reward incredible way of thinking but that's how how terry looked at it and he, it's not only what he said it's it's exactly how he lived you know no one would argue that he wasn't he wasn't just a man of words it was all actions too he 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 backed those words up with action for sure yeah that's such a great point daryl because because those are the kinds of words that in certain circumstances could just be platitudes could be empty words uh but but uh, obviously to almost to a greater extent than anyone else I can think of, he turned those words into deeds, right? And that that was what defined him. Uh, very much, a, you know, part of, part of Terry, words were backed up with actions. Like he, he was um, pr probably a person of few words. I mean, his uh, former um, uh, JV basketball coach, up at SFU could not believe that Terry was communicating, you know, during the marathon of hope that he was speaking to, to large groups of people because he was such an introvert uh, throughout university. Um, but what he said, he meant like he, he you, and you just felt that. I mean, when, you know, you talk about highlight highlights of my life, you know, another one of my highlights is just not only watching Terry run, but listening to him speak, you know, um, you know, at the, at the end of, the day when he just ran 42k 26 miles and he had an opportunity to share his story um for probably the 150th time at that point you know i'm hearing the same story over and over again the same story the same words but when you but when you believe every word that you're sharing you know and i heard that that same story every time and that he was so sincere in how he was sharing those words you were i was i, I needed tissue every time terry spoke because he was so sincere and yet the story was just the same because he believed in every word. So I mean, that's another thing that I, I find was a gift about Terry. Everything he, he spoke, everything he shared, he meant every word. And you were drawn to that. People were drawn to, to it because they could pick up very quickly on this. You know, this guy is, is real. He's, he's sincere. He means everything he's sharing. Incredible. There's so many lessons in that. So, uh, Daryl, last question for this portion. Uh, is there a book that's had a big impact on you? You've been involved, obviously, in a number of different book projects related to Terry's legacy, um, in, including a fantastic one that came out recently that, that was um, uh, a bunch of really important and some, some famous people talking about the, the impact that Terry had on their lives. Um, but is there a book that's had a particularly big impact on you that you would recommend to other people? Well, I'm going to my Terry books again. You know, I, you know, Les, Leslie Scrivener, the, in the bio. Um, the original, the original the book original. about Terry Fox, basically. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's like, it's always close by. Like I'm constantly referring to it because, you know, Terry's in there a lot. Lots of, lots of quotations. Leslie had spent time with Terry, interviewed him once a week since from the beginning of the marathon of hope so um you know it was a very very important and close relationship so um yeah it it's it's a must read if you if you want to to, to become part of the marathon of hope very quickly that that's the book to go to for sure absolutely uh, fun little story. I, I was on the reach for the top team for my high school, the high school quiz show when, when I was in grade 11 and, um, the prize that we got for, for winning a particular round was, was a copy of that book. And I, I still have it. I still have that, that copy of the book. Yeah. Um, all right, Daryl, we're going to take a quick break. I appreciate you answering those questions in just a moment. We are going to continue digging deep with Daryl Fox. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them too. First of all, 
They bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore, and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions, but in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. Dot CA. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. So, Daryl, once again, I, I just want to touch briefly on, on your identity as Terry's younger brother. And, and uh, Here I'm you go curious. again, Mark. <laughs> Where, what is that like? Uh, you know, it, it is, uh, you're in, you, you know, you are one of a small number of people in the world who are sort of identified by their connection to somebody else, right? So that, you know, I suppose it happens, there are, you know, the, uh, the, the wife of the President of the United States is, is defined by her connection to, you know, the, the, the person who's in that job. Um, it's, it, it probably happens. Uh, but, but your whole life has been in the context of your older brother. What's what's that been like for you? Well, the short answer is I don't know what it'd be like not to be um, Terry Fox's brother because I've been his brother, um, well, all my life, obviously, but the icon Terry Fox since 1980, 41 years. So I, I don't I don't know what it's like not to be, but to say what it. What it is like, it's 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 first an, an incredible honor, not surprisingly. It maybe there's a, a sense of um, responsibility as well associated with it because um, you know it's important, for lack of a better word, to protect the brand. It's, this is a very important brand, and um, I never I feel I never want to let Terry down. Um, I never want to let my mom and dad down too, who you know played such an important uh, role in 
you know, the decade post Marathon of Hope when, when we were setting up what we have now created, I guess, or as, a, as a nation, you know, the, the foundation and, and so on. Um, I, I really, I, I was, I'm not, I mean, maybe I have the, you know, I have Terry's uh, a bit of an intro, introvert myself. I don't, I don't look for attention and I don't like it. I run away from it. I think Terry would probably do the same, but I do get, I do get enjoyment and satisfaction out of, you know, when it is all done, like when we finish this interview, Mark, <laughs> I'll, I'll feel, I'll feel good. I'll feel okay that I contributed something, you know, that I've help maybe to, to share a few words about Terry that someone out there might grasp onto it. And that's, that's a really nice feeling. Um, because, because I'm always feeling that I'm like, I'm not quite uh, measuring up, like, you know, because what I witnessed and what I saw was so incredible. I will never be able to find the right words. You know, I'll, I'm always, I'm always striving. And that's, that, that I guess that makes, um, the experience enjoyable because it's always a challenge to say it better and and the way I'd like to say it. Um, um, so um, yeah, it's 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 a little bit of both. It's very ex extremely rewarding being Terry's um, younger brother, um, but it also has its uh, its challenges as well. Yeah, and you know, I'm going to um, I'm going to say that that. I think the story of the Terry Fox Foundation and the, let's call it the Terry Fox movement in Canada and beyond, everything that's happened since the Marathon of Hope began, I think it's as much about your family as it is about Terry. Terry, of course, started it, and he is the, the foundation of everything that has happened. But uh, there are many different ways that, that it could have played out after Terry passed away. And uh, and and something happened there. It wasn't just that he captured the attention of Canadians. There were some very deliberate decisions by you, by the other members of your family, by your parents, um, to to launch something and sustain something really special. So, I honestly feel, as someone who's observed this over the last forty one years, that. This story is as much about you and your brother, Fred, and your parents as it is about Terry, because you carried it on and you've been carrying it on for four decades, uh, something that he did for uh, roughly a year. You've been carrying on for, for four decades, and it didn't necessarily have to turn out this way. It, it could have gone in a different, it could have been something that captured people's attention for a year or two, not almost half a century. Maybe. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I first of all, I, I you know, I, I didn't become an actual member of the Terry Fox Foundation till 1990. So that's a decade later. So um, but I, I do I do agree that certainly my mom and dad played a, a pretty important role because, you know, and I'm more interested. I'm re really fascinated by this now as I get older and dated and, and history becomes really important, really, really important to me, you know, is making sure this, this, this is, this is something mom really believed in ensuring the story is told accurately. You know, we don't need full, full of blemishes, like because Terry was not perfect. It needs to be shared accurately, but there was a handoff Mark, you know, there was some communication between Terry and mom and dad. And, and also those who were assisting my, my mom and dad, the family at that time. And I have to have obviously acknowledge Mr. Sharp, Isidore Sharp, president of Poor Susan Hotel, who's part of the inner circle, who, who you know, Terry said, it has to keep going without me, right? He, he knew that the baton was being passed and that happened. And that happened between Terry and mom and Mr. Sharp. And they, they set up the, the structure and, you know, it's something we really talk about a lot right now, Mark, is it's not, you know, everyone focuses and, and, and it's good that, you know, we're, we're about fundraising for cancer research, but Terry also had values, like, which we've been talking about today is these incredible values. And, um, you know, we, there is no corporate, corporate sponsorship within the Terry Fox Foundation. Wow, you know, here we are 41 years still raising, you know, $25 million every year through the annual run and yet no corporate sponsorship. You know, Terry wanted to promote one thing only, and that was cancer research. And that's what we do. And we're able to do it successfully. So, but again, it, there was that handoff of, of 
you know, uh, values and, and, and focus and mission that Terry gave to, to, to mom and dad and to Mr. Sharp. And, you know, it's interesting, I'm finding documents from 81 and 82 with respect to the first annual Terry Fox ride. And there are guidelines. And, you know, in that document, it references what Terry wanted because this was came directly from him. So that's exciting. And I, and I, I so I, so yes, we have been protectors perhaps to, to a certain extent, the family, um, but it's, we're just carrying out, I, the way I look at it is we're just carrying out what Terry, Terry wanted in, in 1980. And uh, um, it seems to be doing, a, doing, a, doing okay. <laughs> more than okay more than okay um but you know again i i i think there's some hugely hugely powerful lessons in what you just said for individuals for organizations for companies for for movements for charities that that idea that you can never go wrong by sticking to those original core values and there are lots of times where you are challenged uh you know where you're where you're tempted where where the easy answer would be you know what it's it's a tough year we have the potential to raise some more money we could maybe get i'm sure there's i'm sure there's a company somewhere that would happily give you 5 million 10 million 20 million bucks to be a sponsor of the Terry Fox run and you say no to that because you want to stay true to those values and that is part of what has sustained this and what makes this movement so different from any other movement that we've witnessed like it. And uh, so again, I, you know, I think it's, I know you're saying, well, we, we just go back to Terry's values. Uh, he, he established those values, but you've maintained them, you've sustained them. And that, th that involves making a lot of sometimes very difficult decisions. So I admire you and, and the board of the foundation and everybody who's been involved in this movement, but especially your family for, for doing that. Well, I, you know, there, we'll never know whether it was the, the, the right uh, decision to make, but again, we're, we're still relevant. We're still out there. We're still sharing Terry's story. People are still engaged. So I th no one could argue that it didn't work this way, but maybe it could have worked better if we'd gone the other way. We don't, we'll never know the answer to that. I do feel that I do, I do, I will acknowledge that I think the family does play a role there. I mean, of course, our, the, the foundation, incredible staff that work for TFF, our board, volunteers are incredible too. And they believe in that, that the, you know, the vision and, and mission as, as well. But the family are protectors of the values, I think. Um, and we're, you know, we're in the process, just like mom and dad handed off to Fred, Judy and Daryl. Now we're in the process of the next generation of Fox family members. We all have been fruitful and multiplied. And, you know, we're in the process now of handing off to the next generation, our children who are becoming, who are members of the Terry Fox Foundation. Um, That's great. Who are, who are members of, of TFRI. And um, it's, it's been, it's been really, we've really enjoyed the experience actually to, to hand off and, and make way for, for the next generation. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think you're right. And in, in life, you never know, you can't hit control Z and run the scenario a different way and, and see what the outcome is. But, um, but I, I think a huge part of why the movement is still around, why my kids who were not alive when, when Terry was running uh, the marathon of hope and so many generations of kids who, who never saw Terry firsthand, why they know who he is, why he's their hero. You know, that's, that's all because of the deliberate, choices that were made in how this movement was going to be brought forward. So um, I think in this case, maybe we do know the answer to, to that. But uh, so, uh, Daryl, I want to go back to your childhood for a moment. And I, I there's a story I've heard you tell before about picking berries when you were a kid. Um, that that was, uh, I, I, I know you didn't enjoy it, but I, I think there were some lessons there that arose from it, right? Yeah, no, thank you. But no, thank you for bringing that up. Boy, <laughs> I despise that time of, of my life. And it was summers, you know, when you should be sleeping in and, 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 you know, more free time away from that jail of school. But, uh, but no, I, we, um, we were, we picked berries, blueberries. And, you know, we, we never had, we never had to drive anywhere. <laughs> like we had to find our way. And it was, it probably was about, uh, I would say three miles, like, which was a long way for, for, for me anyways. I thought it was forever. And uh, Emo, 
um, who owned the blueberry farm would let, a, let us in, the fox uh, children, in early. Um, so, you know, everyone else, he opened up at nine o'clock, but we could get in at seven o'clock uh, when the berries were still wet. And so, you know, and how you generate revenue is the more the berries weigh, the more you make. So, but he didn't mind paying us more because we had wet berries because we were such good pickers. We picked a tree clean. We were, we, and uh, so, um, but, um, you know, uh, by, Start at seven, usually finish by three, and I'd have three dollars and twenty cents, Mark. Wow, uh, that, that was the fruit of my labor. Um, wow, it it was a lot of picking for very little return. Yeah, but, I think uh, that's that works out to about forty cents an hour, something like that. Yeah, but but I appreciated that three dollars and twenty cents because of the effort that went into to to make it. And, you know, at the end of the summer, after picking those berries, I had enough to buy a bike. And I appreciated that. So it, it, it obviously taught me so many things about, you know, through hard work, and it was hard work, there is a return. And uh, it was a very important um, message for, for a young person. And I, I'm, I guess, took a, a while, but I began to be thankful for mom and dad for <laughs> for. for for pushing me out the door and getting me out of bed and to, to pick those berries. Yeah. I was never a good, a pick as good a picker as Fred and Terry were, you know, as much as I try, like that's, I, I, did I talk about us being competitive? Yeah, we were very competitive. So it was who could <laughs> pick the most berries. So, you know, having that crate of blueberries at the end of the day and, and going to, to, you know, to emo to, to weigh them, that was always an interesting time because it was always a, who, who won, who picked the most berries that day. I was always last. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there an interesting parallel though? And, uh, you know, because you're, um, you know, the marathon of hope was, was one step at a time, one mile at a time, you know, that, that accumulation of that incremental accumulation. Right. And that, you know, th there, there's a parallel there, I think with, you know, you're picking berry after berry after berry, and it adds up to something for the day and each day adds up to something for the week and for the month and for the whole summer. And then you get your bike, right? Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's a great, uh, uh, com comparable. It's exactly how Terry ran like one mile at a time. If he, you know, he knew it, it uh, would take a, a full day to actually appear to be going anywhere. But at the end of the day, like that's what he, he said, okay, I'm, I've gone another 26 miles. I'm this much closer to, to DC it was one step at a time it was one mile at a time it was one day at a time exactly the right uh, very similar to to what his experiences were picking berries so let's talk about when you arrived in st john new brunswick and um and joined the marathon of hope uh, you, as you said you left high school early to do that and and join terry in the summer of 1980 and before we talk about anything else can we just spend a moment on the shorts and t-shirts um from that time and the hair, because uh, there there are some terrific pictures of, of you and Terry from that time, and it was it was definitely 1980, right? Yeah, can we can we move on from that? Do we have <laughs> to bring that up. I know it's so I know it, the long hair, the short shorts. Uh, oh my gosh, I still have to. Oh, it's it's horrible, it's <laughs> terrible. But it it was a, a sign of of the times, and I'm forever um branded with with those images unfortunately but um but that you know is it, it, it's interesting the uniform was, was was interesting and i always i always get a chuckle sometimes because i do see images when we aren't wearing the uniform you know where we're actually in you know a um a long sleeve shirt or, or jeans i don't know what is what happened there i appreciate those photos because i'd rather them circulate more than the short short show photos do but that's not the case but it was a, a summer of, of shorts and socks and, and smelly shoes, absolutely, and smelly yeah. t-shirts too. Yeah, and I don't even want to know what it was like inside that van. <laughs> Must have been no, some... Mark, you really don't, do not know, want to know what, what it was like in, in, inside that van. It, it was three young men who slept and lived there who, who weren't uh, focused on cleanliness at that point in their <laughs> lives. It was not pretty. And there was a porta potty in there too. Oh, yeah, yeah, too much information. Um, 
So, but, but tell me what that, you know, what did, when you arrived, what did you expect and, and what, and, and what was it like in those early days in 19, in, in the summer of 1980? So to, to answer the first question, I don't, I didn't have any expectation. I mean, I was 17 years old, Mark. I like, I was just, I didn't know what to expect. I, um, but I did know that I had to, you know, sit back and take in um, that first, I remember it clearly. Like I remember sitting in, instead of sitting beside Doug, Doug Allward, Terry's close friend who drove the van throughout the marathon of hope, I sat on, on the, on the back bench and I just wanted to take in what it was like. What, what is, what is the routine of, of the marathon of hope? And that's, and that's what I did. Um, I was, I was immediately fast. I mean, I saw Terry run, Terry ran over 3000 miles preparing for the marathon of hope, but, and I saw many of those miles, but to watch him actually fulfilling this dream of running across the country was just took it to another level, you, you know, just to see the expression on his face and how driven and determined he, it was hard not to be incredibly moved by it. And that's what I, that's what frustrated me. I remember from the first day is like, why isn't everybody taking this in? Like it was so overwhelming. And yet Terry ran through St. John without, with little fanfare. It was really interesting, um, you know, and I'm, I'm wondering why, as I'm wa- wa- watching this, why everyone isn't stopping, stopping their car, stopping what they're doing to take in what they're witnessing. It was so incredibly moving. Um, that would happen later on, but it, it wasn't actually there all the time in the beginning of the Marathon of Hope. Yeah, and it, it took some time, but, but once, uh, you know, I, I think there are almost... Um, I'm sure there were many chapters to the, to the story, but I think you could divide it almost into two sections. One is the the period when the momentum was still building, and when you know the the story was not national news every single night. And when I know you ran through some some towns in Quebec, for example, where there there wasn't a lot of attention. And then the second half of the story really was, I think, kind of starting when you crossed into Ontario and and uh, you went to Parliament Hill and you went to the Ottawa Rough Riders game. And then, of course, there was this massive, massive crowd awaiting in Toronto. And 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 that that chapter, I mean, all of a sudden now you're it's a totally different experience where everywhere you go, there are people waiting. Right. It, it, it's like a completely different uh, uh, environment than what you experienced in the early days. Right. For sure. Uh, but I'm, I'm always quick to say that if we hadn't, if Terry hadn't experienced the support he had in the five provinces pre Ontario, Ontario would not have happened. Like they, they were the base, you know, it was hit and miss at times for sure. Absolutely. But more often than not, the communities were extremely supportive of Terry. Look at Port of Basque, you know, the last community in, in Newfoundland that, uh, you know, Terry ran to before jumping on the ferry and going to, um, to Sydney, Nova Scotia, population 10,000, they raised $10,000. And that's where Terry came up with the idea of raising, forgetting about a million dollars, I want to raise a dollar from every Canadian. So the support was there early on and Terry saw the potential. Um, He was frustrated at times in in certain communities when, because he couldn't do it himself. I mean, that's what, that's what it was. The Marathon of Hope wasn't just about Terry. It was, a, it, it was co- us collectively coming together and he knew he needed help. He knew he needed the Canadian Cancer Society and their volunteers to, to organize events in, in the communities he was about to run through. And uh, that was a very important part of the success. And, and so, you know, what happened in the five um, provinces pre-Ontario was extremely important to the chaos that, that we experienced mm. in, in Ontario as soon as we crossed the border. It was just, um, it, it was a different level. It was, um, you know, I, we would later on, of course, Terry primarily would learn to appreciate some of the quiet times of the early part of the Marathon of Hope because there was no free time once we crossed the border. It was just chaos. Are there any moments that stand out for you that are not among the sort of obvious moments like Nathan Phillips square in Toronto and so on. Are there even private moments that you had with Terry, anything like that, that's sort of a lasting memory for you from um, among the thousands of memories you must have from that year. 
I always, so in terms of just the marathon of home memory, like I, I always, I don't know what it was about the lake shore, you know, outside, maybe it was because we, we left, you know, Toronto and, and what happened at Nathan Phillips square, you know, 10,000 people there, Scarborough civic center, huge emotional to the quiet and peacefulness of Lakeshore Boulevard between Toronto and, and Hamilton. Like I, I, I just, I, I, of any point of the marathon of hope, somehow I can put myself there more than any other place. And I can, I can see Terry running. Um, it just wasn't as, you know, there, there were people there, lots of people there, but it was so peaceful and quiet and, and beautiful and sunny and, and you know, summer that I, I, I really value that those memories. And the other memory, I guess, if I were to pick one from Terry, is just um, Montreal River Hill, in, you know, in Northern Ontario, this, this hill, which was supposed to be this incredible obstacle for Terry in terms of being able to run up it. And, and the night before, you know, the, the barbecue we had and, and, you know, John Simpson and the I Had a Dream uh, video crew were, were there to film it. And just the, the, the feeling of togetherness and, and Terry, you know, there are, there are um, shots and video of him just having a good time and relaxing and not, we just, we, it was just a very special evening. Um, and uh, that one really stands out just because I appreciate the fact that Terry was, was really relaxed and enjoying himself, which wasn't always the case, certainly in Ontario. So, Jumping ahead to the to the work that has been done for the past forty years and longer, um, what if what are some of the challenges that you've encountered along the way? The the foundation, the research institute, and and uh, I'm sure you know as as much as you've built on this incredible legacy, and as much as in Canada and and certainly beyond, there's there's so much currency to Terry's story. Um, that, that there are lots of people lining up to want to support this movement. I'm sure there have been tough times as well. What are, what are some of the challenges that you've experienced? Well, we're certainly going through some serious challenges right now, Mark, for obvious reasons. You know, we, we are, you know, the foundation is, is responsible for the annual Terry Fox run. And for 40 years, we've been coming together every September collectively, just like we did in 1980 when people came out and supported the marathon of hope and we haven't been able to do that we weren't able to do that last year and it looks like we're not going to be able to do that this year and and that's our vehicle that's our fundraising vehicle so we've been really impacted by by covid and uh you know how many times have we heard you know p- people say those of us who work in in you know are, are active in um this um responsibility of raising money for cancer research um, that guess what? Cancer's not taking a time out. You know, it's not it's not in a holding pattern here. People are still being diagnosed with cancer. Less people are being diagnosed with cancer because they're not in a position to be able to to be diagnosed because of the limitations and restrictions. So it it's a hugely challenging time for us, certainly from the foundation perspective in terms of fundraising. Um, but also the you know, and as a direct result to that we've had to make serious uh, uh, cutbacks to research programs as a result. Now we know we're gonna get back there, but, uh, but it has been challenging. We also know we're not alone. But before you know, we, we encountered these challenges, I think what I, what I really appreciate is the fact that the Terry Fox Research Institute has been partnering with, with other cancer um, uh, research uh, funders. So, you know, the, the Princess Margaret Hospitals, the BC Cancer, the McGill Universities, all the major cancer research funders out there are, are partners in, with, with respect to TFRI. The next step, and, and I think that's so important because that's what Terry did, he brought a nation together. So now we're bringing research organizations together. The next step is to bring actual foundations together. You know, the actual, you know, because there, there's a tendency to be competitive. We got to drop that. And we have to find a way to work together. As pre, even pre-COVID, we needed to, to, to think about this. And that's, I, I think that's what uh, Terry Fox, the brand, can do, um, is bring organizations and people and researchers together. And that's going to be our focus going forward. The mission is not complete, obviously. Uh, we have not eradicated cancer. Uh, but, but along the way, there are... Uh, there are 
many milestones that have been achieved in the last 40 years. Um, and I know that when people think of uh, the Terry Fox movement, they think of the runs and they think of the fundraising and that the money's going towards this mission and towards cancer research. And they may not be as aware of the, the stories about where the money is being invested and, and the impact it's having. Um, at a Terry Fox run one year, I had the pleasure of meeting somebody who suffered from exactly the same cancer that Terry had, but didn't lose her leg and made a full recovery. And that's one example of, of the progress that we've made. Um, what, are, what are some of the milestones that have been important to you on the research side, on the funding side, as opposed to the fundraising side? Well, that be that would obviously be one of them, and I'm you know that's not perhaps fair to focus there because it's personal. But seeing the you know the the progress that has been made in osteosarcoma, um, you know the the fact that Terry, there's a really good chance he would live today. There's it, it's not a hundred percent, but there's a better chance that he would live today, and there's a, a good chance that he may not have lost his leg. So that that is 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 big. Survival rates for many forms of of cancer have increased quite quite dramatically over the last 40 years. Um, what what's clearly evident is in one of the programs the foundation has is our Terry's Team program, which um, if you go to a Terry Fox Run site on you know in September when when we we're able to do that, you'll you'll see cancer survivors wearing red T-shirts, and you know guess what? There's more red T-shirts every year. And that's a clearly a sign of, of progress. It's, 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 Terry knew in 1980 that, you know, he made whatever investment and in, in effort he was putting into fundraising for cancer research, he may not benefit from it. He, he, in fact, he knew he wouldn't. Um, but he knew it was, as we talked about earlier, one step at a time, one mile at a time. It's, it's one loony at a time. It's one breakthrough at a time. Over time, we're getting there and we will get there going forward. Um, it, it just might happen. It's not going to happen as quickly as we'd like, but certainly everything suggests that one day we will realize Terry's dream. And that, that, uh, is what it's all about. And is that what continues to motivate and inspire you? I mean, what, what keeps you going? Uh, because this has become your life's work, right? This is, this has become your career, um, over, over decades now. Um, so, so what is it that, that keeps you devoted to this and gets you up every day to go to work on this mission. Yeah, that's what, that's absolutely what, keep, what keeps me motivated is not, you know, I, I, I am one person who's been impacted by cancer and, and lost a brother to this disease. So I just would like, to, you know, in a very simplistic way, would like to see it not happen to anyone else. That, that's what keeps me inspired and motivated is I saw what this disease does. And I've seen it more than once. My dad died of lung cancer as well. So I, and now, in fact, that was probably a, a more, it was a more challenging experience because I was quite a bit older, obviously, and more knowledgeable. And it, it had, and whereas in Ter Terry's case, you know, one, one of the reasons why I don't remember is because I was removed from it because Terry didn't want us to see him suffer. He didn't, we didn't see the pain. We didn't see what he was going through. But with dad, we saw it all. Like we really saw it all. We saw the impact of his disease. So I'm even, I was already motivated. I'm even more motivated by what I witnessed with, with my dad. And so that's, that's what keeps me going is I, you know, I know that every loony is $1 less to, to finding the answers to this disease. So I'm, I'm totally committed. Like I'm so committed to this. And I, you know, I know I, one day I won't be around and it'll be, it'll be someone else who's going to have to pick up the baton, but uh, while I can, and while I'm able, I'm completely committed to, to this uh, vision that, that, that Terry gave to me. So you once had a, a running streak going uh, where you would run every single day uh, for many years, right? Can you, can you tell me about that? Yeah, I, I miss it. Actually, it, um, I ran for um, 13 and a half years without taking a day off. And it actually ended on July 28th, 2011. Which is Terry's birthday, right? 
it was Terry. It ended on Terry's birthday and it, it ended after my, my mom had passed away who hated my running streak. <laughs> so she was, she was never able to experience the end of it. So which she would have, she would have jumped for joy, you know? Um, Why did she but, hate it? Because it's, I would have to ignore it. at some point it um, became inconvenient in terms of family gatherings. And, you know, I, I, if I was over at mom and dad's for a dinner, I always had to sneak out and run at least 5k. So it was always there. Um, so you're a bit, you're, well, I, I know from experience what that can be like, you, you become a bit of a slave to it at times, right? To, it, to keep it, the streak became, going. Yeah. Yeah. Keep, yeah. And, and a couple of times it was like, I, I remember one time I, I think I was flying to Dubai and I forgot I had run. And so as soon as I got off the plane, I had to, to run it outside, um, outside the airport to get my run in. So that's kind of silly. And so I, for that, uh, from that perspective, I'm, I'm glad it's over, but I do miss it. Like uh, I, it ended on Terry's birthday because I had knee surgery. Um, so I, I went for a 10K run and then an hour later I was under the knife. And, and now I can't put two days together, Mark. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's terrible, but I have my bike and I love riding now. So Yeah, I know you're really into cycling now, right? That's, yeah, that's become yeah. your, new, your, new, uh, your new obsession a little bit. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. A so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more than a little bit. <laughs> yeah, more than a little bit. We live in a, you know, I live out here in, in the Fraser Valley, Cholak, and it's a just, it's, it's a stunning place to, to ride a bike both. And now more recently, I've, I found a gravel ride. So now I'm exploring the four, four service roads and trails and dikes in, in the area. And it's just, just stunning, beautiful place. It's the best, you know, what I like about any sort of exercise is, you know, at the end of a day, and it's usually at the end of the day that I would go for a run or go for a bike ride. It's the perfect time to, to think. Like I do my best thinking and I don't do a lot of it. I'm not very good at it, but when I do do it, it, it happens when I'm out for a run or I'm on a bike and it just clears the, the brain. And I always come back from a bike ride having an idea of what I'm going based on what happened that day and the challenges I experienced of, a, a way forward. So, um, advice to people out there: pick it up, no matter what you do, whether it's a walk or, or just getting out there. It's a it's a really good way to to think things out. Yeah, it's so people think it's all about physical health. It's a, it's uh, it's more about to me. It's more about mental health than it is about physical health. It's great, completely. Yeah. So, tell me about the work that you do now. Uh, you, you're, you have a role with the, you worked with the foundation for a number of years. Now you spend, I think you spend more of your time with the Terry Fox Research Institute, right? I do. Yeah. I'm senior advisor at, uh, the Terry Fox Research Institute. And I'm, I'm all, I'm also pretty active with many of the, I'll say Terry story projects. So those remain the responsibility of, of the family. Uh, so if there's an interest in a book or a movie, um, any sort of request to use Terry's name for recognition purposes or an award, for example, you know, the, the family is, is very engaged and active on, on those activities. And what's interesting is they, they haven't faded with time. If anything, there, there, there seems to be more opportunities um, at, at this time than there, there were a decade ago. So you mentioned, you know, the, the, the book, we published last year of um, for the 40th anniversary. There was also a children's book last year. Um, so there's some really interesting projects that are in the works right now that we look forward to sharing um, with everyone coming up. So Daryl, as you look back on your own life and the work that you've done in this space and the, and the, the mission that you've been helping to carry forward that your brother started, what are, what are, what, how do you sum it up? What are some of the lessons that you've learned and experienced? What are the, what are the kind of the eternal messages that you, that you think the, the lasting implications of this and the, the most powerful kind of themes that emerge from everything you've seen over the last 41 years since Terry dipped his artificial leg in the Atlantic ocean? Well, I guess, um, you know, it's always the Terry perspective. I, I, I think that, um, it, I'm, I'm satisfied, I'm content with the journey that I've been on. Like, I, I don't have too many regrets. I, I've, I'm, I've learned a lot, 
I've experienced a lot. I would do th certain things differently for sure. Um, but in terms of the path and the journey and the road that Terry put us on, I can say very confidently that it was the right road. Like I, I think I'm on the right, right path. And so that's very um, fulfilling and rewarding. And I, you know, I know, you know, whatever, whenever it's time to, to hand off that I can do so. And I'm in a position to do so now and feel very comfortable with, with what has happened over the last 40 years. I'm, I'm content, I'm satisfied, and I'm pretty proud of, and I'm proud of what, how this country has embraced Terry. Like I just, I can't speak enough about, you know, and how often that happens to me, Mark, how, you know, out, an out of the blue message from a, from a parent who, whose son came home and has identified Terry for a school project and would like some, some information, some inside information and to be able to, to participate in that, um, you is, you can never, you know, you can never put a value on that. It's just the most rewarding feeling out there. And that's what's still there for me. And uh, I'm pretty lucky that I've had 40 years to be able to experience it. And I, I hope I never take it for granted because that then someone else needs to do it because they need to cherish and feel what I feel every day. Well, Daryl, this has been a real pleasure as always. Uh, I, I take so much away from every conversation we have and I'm so grateful uh, to be connected to you and through you to my greatest hero um, uh, since I was 12 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I, I have, you know, so much affection for Terry Fox and he plays such a big part in my life, but I, I have enduring respect for you and your siblings and your parents for what you did after Terry passed away. Because I think, again, that is as much a part of this story as, as Terry's journey was, um, it, it did not end up being, a one or two or five year thing. It is 40 years and going strong. Uh, it's going to last for generations. Um, my grandkids and their grandkids are going to know who Terry Fox was and they're going to raise money and, and, um, and they're going to keep this mission going as long as it needs to go. And that, I think that's the story of the entire Fox family, not just Terry Fox. So thank you for all you've done and thank you for your time today. Oh, my pleasure, Mark. Enjoyed it as always. Thank you for making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I said this to, to you earlier. I think there was an interview where you made me cry. So now we're even. Okay, we're even. <laughs>